everybody. Welcome back to my vlog. Adam Flowers here. And uh, let's get started today. Uh, welcoming a few people into the room to get things going until we get a few more folks in here. And uh, Diana Marie, JoJo, A Tribe Called Cookies, 4.com. What's going on, tough guy? Good to see you guys in here today. And a uh, really cool topic today. Uh, we're going to dive into and we're going to look at a lot of different uh, things that uh, video clips, some newspaper articles, George, what's happening? Cheers. Um, we're going to look at a whole lot of things uh, regarding and around Frank Bluestein. Now, on the Vegas mob tour, we, uh, we, we go past the spot where this incident occurred. It was also depicted in the movie Casino. Uh, they show a scene. I'm going to play it for you guys in, a, in just a few minutes. But they show a scene, and, uh, and it depicts the police shooting the guy. And, and, and uh, the voiceover says, uh, they even shot blue. They even got blue. Things got so bad, they shot blue. Uh, and then they show uh, Tony's house, uh, you know, the Pesci character be, being shot up in the movie. We're going to get into all of what went on with this because it's it's quite an incredible story uh, when when you hear the whole thing. It's probably it's pretty wild. Bob Manolados, Manolados, nice to see you. Okay, so uh, yeah, we got 20, 20 of you guys in there. Hit the like button so this video gets spread around, guys. Let's get it going around, and uh, then we'll get into this whole Frank Bluestein. Uh, Frank Bluestein situation. Mike Alexander, good afternoon. Sean Pender, how are you? Uh, King Ruger, how are you guys doing? Great, excellent. We're up to 35. Good. Our room's filling up, and we're going to get this uh, this little session started. And I'm going to tell you guys, it's a lot different than what we've been doing. I think that I'm starting to finally uh, get kind of uh, a feel for this uh, this software that I'm using. What's happening, Brett? Uh, Nikki Andrews, what's going on? Ronald Smith, uh, thanks so much, Ron. I appreciate those nice words. Mike Hatfield. Okay, guys. So here's what here's what we're gonna do. We got 30 people in here, so let's get this thing going. Uh, so everyone, I want to thank you guys for being here and for watching this and for listening to me go on about this. But uh, welcome back, guys. It's my vlog. So happy Saturday, everybody, on 2-20-2021. 2-20-2021. Uh, that's today, Saturday. And uh, what we're going to talk about is the Frank Bluestein incident that took place here in Las Vegas back in uh, 1980. On June 9th, this is what happened. Uh, in front of the Upper Crust Pizza, and for those of you that have been on the Vegas Mob Tour uh, uh, that have been out here, you're, you sound like you, do I really, hold on one second, guys. I want to fix this with the audio on here if I sound like I'm in a tin can because I really should not sound like I'm in a tin can. Uh, give me just a moment here and let me take a look at what's happening. Default man, speakers, default. Hold on one second, guys. And let's see here. Is that any better? Can you guys hear me any better with this? Uh, Yes or no, let me know, and I will move on with this. I just want to make sure that I do, uh, that you guys are picking me up and are able to hear me. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, let me speak up a little bit and raise the gain on my mic a uh, tad. Okay, so here is... So here's what went down, guys. In the Upper Crust uh, Pizza parking lot, back in the uh, 1980, uh, they used undercover uh, police officers. They dressed them undercover, sat them in unmarked cars. As a matter of fact, on June 9th, it was Detective Groover and Sergeant Smith, Gene Smith, that were sitting in the parking lot of the Upper Crust, and they were watching it. They're doing surveillance. 
And that evening, a young man named Frank Bluestein, who was from Elmwood Park, he had a, a clothing store called Mr. Blues. Uh, it wasn't doing too well, so he packed it up and he moved out to Las Vegas. His mother and his father were, uh, were living out here, his mother and father. Okay, so his father was in the culinary union. He was connected to the culinary union. I believe he was the president of the culinary union, although I'm not 100% sure of that, but he did definitely had some clout. Frank got a job out here, Frankie, as a, as a maitre d' inside the hacienda. The hacienda is now the site of Mandalay Bay. For those of you that, uh, those, those of you, listen to me. For those of you who uh, uh, who haven't been out here or weren't out here back in those days, so that's where he worked, and he on the night of June 9th, pulled up to the upper crust. He was in a Lincoln Mark IV. It was a '79, brand new car, uh, and it had Illinois license plates on it. He got out of the car and he went into the uh, the upper crust and ordered a pizza. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a clip from, uh, from Casino, and this is where it was depicted in the movie Casino. Let's take a look here, guys. Check this out. Here it is, bring up uh, Spilatro's house. So, uh, so there we go. Uh, so that's the clip in the movie, and that's why he's wearing the blue leisure suit, and they say he shot blue because this is a depiction of the Frank Bluestein incident. Now, did the police officers use uh, deadly force? Uh, was it justified or wasn't it justified? So let's let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at a few things, a few different articles. Uh, Denny Griffin, who's been on here before, he did a really uh, he did a really good job. Uh, kind of summarizing it in his book, uh, Battle for Las Vegas. And he did a lot of research. Uh, I know he did a ton of research. I've talked to him about it. And I remember talking to you about this incident a few times. But this is what, uh, this is what he wrote um, and what he said. And this is also what I took in from, from Frank Collada because Frank also was there that night. When, uh, when Frankie Blue went into the upper crust, he ordered, number one, pizza. It wasn't a Euro sandwich like they showed in the movie. It was a pizza. So the pizza probably took, depending on if it's a thin crust or if it was a stuffed pizza or a deep dish or somewhere in between, probably around 20 to 30 minutes he was inside uh, the upper crust, we can assume. Frank said that Frankie talked to him while he was in the upper crust and told him that he was paranoid. He thought he was being followed and he thought that somebody was trying to rob him. He also told Frank Collada that he had a gun in the car. So these Frank and Tony told Frankie Blue, get the hell out of here. Don't, don't park your car here with Illinois tags on it because the cops are watching us. So if they see you, they're going to raise suspicion about you. You have a clean record. Don't bother coming around here. So Frank, uh, so Frankie left. Now, according to Detective David Groover and Sergeant Gene Smith, who was sitting in the parking lot in an unmarked vehicle with Arizona plates on it, Frankie Blue left the upper crust, started heading eastbound on Flamingo. They followed him. They said he went to speeds 80 to 90 miles an hour down Flamingo Road. Flamingo Road, for those of you that don't live here, is a 40 or 45 mile an hour zone, depending on where you are. He went all the way down Flamingo, made a left on McLeod, started heading northbound. That's where he lived, the Sunrise Villas. And they pulled up to him at the gate, and they said that, uh, they say that, uh, Detective Groover's driving, Gene Smith's in the passenger side. Uh, it was Smith who saw the gun and yelled, Davey's got a gun, look out. And they both at that point had their weapons drawn and they shot 18 rounds into the car. 
four of them hit Frankie Bluestein in the back. So was he getting out of the car when they started to shoot and he fell back into the car and got hit? All of that, I'm, I'm not certain of how that could have happened. Uh, but these two officers, um, these two officers were involved in other situations where they could have used uh, deadly force, justified, but yet they didn't use deadly force. So what happened? Was it, uh, you know, was it, was it uh, the officers? But any, any, anyway, the family blows up over it, which of course, why, their son gets killed. Why wouldn't they be upset? So the family, Tony Spilatro, Oscar Goodman, Oscar Goodman as well, all got in uh, and uh, they, they filed suit against the police, against the Metro Police and against the officers and against the Sheriff's Department. There was a whole lot of, they said if they weren't following him in plain clothes, uh, he wouldn't have thought he was being robbed. They said the gun wasn't his. He didn't have a gun. The cops planted a gun. Uh, in another suit, they said that the cops, after killing him, then searched the car, found the gun, and planted it on him. You see, the gun came back registered to Frank Bluestein's brother in Chicago. So it was his brother's gun. But the family claimed that Frank didn't know it was in the car. So the police planted the gun, is what they said. So uh, his his father, uh, Steve Bluestein, his mother, I believe, was uh, Rose, if my memory serves me correct. Uh, anyhow, it was around 11.45 p.m. The handgun that they found on him was a 22. Uh, that was the that was the firearm that they pulled off of Frank Bluestein. So, was it justifiable homicide? Let's take a look at another little bit of video. Um, because you see, after this happened, word came out from Chicago to Las Vegas that there was a contract put out on Groover and Gene Smith's life. At which point, uh, Kent Clifford, who was uh, the commander of the unit, got permission to go to Chicago with him and another guy, another officer. And when they got to Chicago, Hold on to yourselves when you hear this. They got to Chicago and they they approached Joseph Ayupa's house, knocked on the door early in the morning. Supposedly, uh, his wife answered, said he wasn't home. Then he went to Sam Giancana's house, knocked on the door there. Tony Accardo's house, knocked on his door. So Ayupa, Accardo, and Giancana up to their doors, knocked on him. No one answered. So they got to Dorfman, Alan Dorfman's office, who was their, uh, the attorney for these, these guys, the wise guys in Chicago. So they wanted to have a face-to-face -face with these bosses, uh, and Kent Clifford wanted to, uh, to talk to him about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, Clint, uh, Kent Clifford recalls, quote, Ayupa wasn't home when we arrived, only his wife was there, and she wouldn't let us in. I told her it was very important that I talk with her husband, I left her the phone number for our motel and asked to make sure um, he called me. Oh, the next visit they went to was, sorry, Joe, the clown Lombardo's house. He wasn't home either, but his wife invited us in the house and talked for about 10 minutes. We left the same message with her as with Mrs. Ayupa. Then they went to Tony Accardo's house. So I'm sorry, they didn't go to Sam Giancana's. My, I, I apologize. It was Accardo, uh, Ayupa, and Lombardo. So Dorfman, they got to his office and Dorfman was there and they said, we want to see these guys and we want to have a meeting with them. And Dorfman, let's see here. He said, when I got to Dorfman's office, I walked past the reception desk looking for him. The secretary said, I couldn't do that. And I told her to watch me. I guess it was quite an entrance. Anyway, he said, we got to see Dorfman and explain the situation to him. He got uh, said to go back to the motel and someone would be in touch. Um, that afternoon, a lawyer representing the mobsters called. He said, I ran the whole scenario by him and requested a personal meeting with his clients. He said he'd talk with them and get back to me. Called a little bit later and said uh, the meet, that there would be a meeting, but that I wasn't invited. Um, although that didn't make me very happy, there wasn't a lot I could do about it. 
told the lawyer to relay a message to his clients, just like I gave it to him. This is what Kent Clifford said, quote, and this is to <laughs> Accardo, Lombardo, and uh, in Iupa, quote, if you kill my cops, I'll bring 40 men back here and kill everything that moves, walks, or crawls around all the houses I visited today. This is not a threat, but it's a promise. So the lawyer, he promised he'd deliver the message exactly how it was given to him. And he then told him, he said, if the contracts were lifted, I'd get a phone call saying, have a safe journey home, Commander. If I didn't get a call, all bets were off. So that is exactly, and then at two in the morning, he got a phone call that said, uh, you know, have a safe trip home, Commander. Here is uh, some footage, uh, Kent Clifford passed away several years ago, but here is some footage of Kent Clifford. And let me uh, pull this up here and show you this uh, quick interview off of the uh, the local news out here, did a quick interview. On to a tribute 12. to our city's shady past. He's of organized crime. And and, uh, we're taking a look at the activities Vegas. of La Cosa Nostra sure. in our city's past. Check it dates back out. to at least the 1940s and elements still exist today. But the period many refer to as the mob era was the mid-60s through early 80s. Despite its title, News 3's Tom Hawley tells us many of the criminals were not organized at all. Uh, Jim and Jessica, men like Tony the Ant Spilatro, Frank Collada, Fat Herbie Blitzstein, and Gaspar Spaciale seem to run free with loan sharking, burglary, and murder, all drawn here around the casino skim. The battle to take the worst offenders down began in earnest in 1979. A year later, the operation resulted in an unexpected turn that ratcheted up the tension on both sides. We had 24 hour surveillance. The, my officers were working. 12 hours a day, 12 on and 12 off. I, had, I didn't have enough men to have three shifts. I needed more men to cover all the people who were recovering. Commander Kent Clifford ran the Metro Intelligence Bureau. One of the spots they watched was the Upper Crust Pizzeria. By the way, guys, there is the Upper Crust. That's what it looked like, uh, the building back in those days. It has changed around quite a bit since then. But we do go past it on the biggest mobs. Owned by known gang associates. They like to sit out on the summer nights and talk on a warm night. Then on the left, uh, over on the far left, is Tony Spilatro. Then sitting down, seated with the sunglasses, is Frank Collada. And then just to his right is Ernie Davino. And standing up in the picture right here is uh, Nick, who was uh, Frank's father in law, Nick Costanza. Tonka. They had chairs outside. On June 9, 1980, Detective David Groover and Sergeant Gene Smith saw an unfamiliar person arrive. A new Chicago plated car came to town and ended up at the Upper Crust. So Chicago Upper Crust meant mob. When the man, a Hacienda Hotel Mater D, drove off, so did police. All they was going to do was follow him and see where he went. They didn't, wasn't going to stop him. But he went 90 miles an hour down Flamingo Road. This is where it all came to a head on McLeod just off Flamingo. The Cadillac stopped just past the guard gate, the unmarked car right behind. As one officer approached, the other said he saw a gun. Officers ordered the man to freeze. When he began to get out of the car, they opened fire. Police say he received over 10 gunshot wounds. While that right there has very good grouping. I just want to point that out. Good grouping. While seated inside his car. Reporter Holly Eccles covered the case for Channel 3 and provided a name for the dead man. Frank Bluestein is the son of Steve Bluestein, whose name came out in the 1979 wiretaps of reputed mobster Anthony Spilatro. At an inquest attended by Bluestein's family, Groover explained that he had clearly identified himself. Now, now remember, I told you the family had a big outcry over this. And by the way, uh, not to ruin the story, for you guys, but there was never any settlements that happened. Uh, with the, the family lost all of the cases against the police, but right down to the civil civil suits that they filed uh, that lasted up to seven years. It wasn't it wasn't over until like eighty seven. I'm going to show you that in, in just a moment, though. Back to this. Remember what I said about the family, and listen to the the uh, mom scream out in the in the court. Listen. As I was walking around the door to my police vehicle, the driver of the Lincoln displayed a gun pointing it in my direction through the window. That's a lie! Shut the lie! Shut up, murder! Murder! That's a lie! Murder! My son! 
son. The family and the upper crust crew alleged the gun had been planted. No way, says Clifford. That was his brother's gun. It was registered to his brother. So how could we plan it? A jury was satisfied, but word came back from the FBI that a hitman had been hired back east. Bought a gun and came to Las Vegas. Well, which, by the way, uh, you guys can look this up. I'm sure I read it somewhere. Jerry Scarpelli was one of those guys, part of the Wild Bunch. Jerry Scarpelli and one other uh, guy, I can't remember his name. That one goes off out of my mind. Somewhere I read it. They, they, they do have it somewhere where who the two hitmen were. They met in Ron Bluestein's office and discussed killing Smith and Gruber. Clifford took the initiative, flew to Chicago, and confronted Alan Dorfman, an associate of outfit leader Joey Dove Zayupa. I told him if they killed my cops, I would come back to Chicago with 40 men, and I would kill everything that moved, walked, or crawled around their house. And they needed to know that. It was not a threat. It was a promise. Later, a lawyer called. He said, we're having a meeting later tonight. If you get a call that says, have a safe journey home, Commander, you'll know there's not a contract. If you don't get a call, I'll bet you're off. Clifford went out for dinner, entertainment, then back to the hotel. And I fell off to sleep. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. And a voice on the other end of the line was not the, it was one of the mobsters. He wanted to give me the message. He said, have a safe journey home, Commander. There you have it. So, uh, Kent Clifford has got balls of steel. All right. It's all I got to say, or had balls of steel. Uh, because going up to those guys is I mean threatening these guys, you're, you're out of your mind. You've lost you lost either that or you're really serious. And I believe Kent was pretty uh pretty damn uh serious. So yes, that's what uh that's what happened. And anyway, let me show you one more uh one more quick thing uh to wrap up the whole uh to wrap up this whole story. And let me just put up the right tab here I believe that's it let's get this on the screen okay so you guys can see the mm, actually that's the wrong one hold on one second that let me get the right one up here hey art kelly i just saw that you said hi how are you and chandler doing today Share the location. Maybe I moved. Former city council. Yeah, it's the Tribune. Here it is. The last spin. Okay, I found it. Guys. There we go. Okay, so this is what took place. After the uh, uh, after uh, seven years, see March third, nineteen eighty seven, and this happened in nineteen eighty. So um, J James Montgomery was the uh, the attorney. So after eight weeks, Montgomery urged the jury to award one point six million dollars in damages to the estate of Frank Bluestein, thirty five, a former Elmwood Park man killed by police. So one one point six million that they went for. Of course, didn't get it. Uh, the original suit was filed in 1980. Uh, more than $22 million in damages were sought. Uh, and of course, oh, what's this? Richard Gruber. That's supposed to be David Gruber. You guys, the uh, Tribune made a mistake. It should be David Gruber. Um, he resigned his $90,000 post, Montgomery did, to work on the case. Uh, and if they had won, Montgomery would have cleared almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's what he would have made on it. Anyway, they, uh, you know, they called him a great lawyer, a great showman, uh, putting on his case. Uh, and in the end, they turned up nothing. Uh, and there you go. 
And they're, they're, they're big. See here at the end, they say Montgomery uh, contended the shooting was a result of Las Vegas police policy of using plainclothes officers to stop individuals they suspected had organized crime links to harass them or question them. Frank Lustein was a hardworking six-day-a-week man on his day off. Montgomery told the jury he hadn't spat upon the street, hadn't done anything wrong. They didn't know if he was a priest or a pimp. They didn't know who he was. So that was their big argument in court uh, about the killing. And uh, again, the family did not win, uh, did not win uh, despite all of their uh, efforts. So what happened that day? We're not going to know. Uh, but if I get a chance to interview Frank Bluestein in my next life, like Denny Griffin said, it's the first question he's going to ask. Did you have a gun? So anyway, I hope that you guys did enjoy this today. And I'm glad that you guys uh, did sit in. Be sure to hit the like button. Get the video up there, guys. Uh, hit the like button. Today I wasn't going to do a live at 2 p.m. because I was supposed to be out and about. But it is windier than heck in town. And uh and the friends that I had here that were going to go do the mob tour said they would rather uh, reschedule on their next trip because it was so, uh, it's kind of really windy out today. So anyway, thanks for sticking around, guys. Thanks for watching. And uh, let me say some hellos. If you guys want to hang out, you can hang out for a little while with me. Uh, if you guys are just watching this for the Frank Bluestein section, it's uh, that's the end of it, okay? Come on the tour out here in Vegas, and I'll take you right up to the gates where it happened. We'll drive from the upper crust to the location, just like uh, like they did in real life, and how it went down. I'll show you guys the route where they drove and where the shooting occurred. So, um, anyway, let me say hi to some of you. Uh, so, yeah, Art Kelly, thanks for watching. Love you too, brother. Uh, Chain Weaver, um, good to see you. David Grip. Grimp, nice to see you. Um, yeah, I could use a sheet of plywood. I mean, who can't use a sheet of plywood, right? Tony Montana, what's going on? Lexi Johnson, those coppers was jagoffs. Well, it depends on it depends on depends on what really happened. You know, again, those coppers were involved in other incidences where they could have used lethal force and they didn't. So. John Hermans, turn your volume up if you don't have any sound. Uh, and I don't know why, because a lot of other people are saying that they can hear me. I switched over on the microphone, although I'm not on my, my very good microphone because I, I uh, screwed up when I started the stream. Technical stuff. We'll get this figured out. Uh, any evidence of blue pointing gun at cops or saying anything to set them off? Uh, George, is there any evidence of blue pointing guns at the cops? You have the cops' testimony. It's 1980. It's not like, you know, there's a camera on everybody's house in the neighborhood, and let's go pull that footage, that footage, that footage. Let's go pull the, the, the cops' body cams. You couldn't do that in 1980. So is there is there evidence? There's the police officers' testimonies under oath. That's the evidence. And, of course, there's the gun that was registered to his brother that, was in the car with him. So there's the other evidence. Again, that was the big thing the family said was not, you know, um, wasn't, you know. And, and, and here's the other. Frank Collada also said that Frankie Blue told him he had a gun in the car. So if, if Frank Collada heard him say it, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to go with there was probably a gun in the car, and the guy probably was paranoid thinking he was going to be robbed. That's what the police said. Could something else have happened? Could have. I don't think we're going to know, though. So there's your answer, George. Johan Hermans. I bet the weather's better in Texas. I bet. Great news footage. Thanks, Tony Montana. Uh, Clifford looks like Martin Short. Yeah, just a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Uh, Johan Hermans. Uh, trade and sec, better alive and though. Yeah, no, life was different back then. It really was. You could you could drive around without everybody knowing where you were. And completely different uh, time. The retroholic Adam. You should get someone on who can talk about the flash trucking crew. Big Mike Spano and the rest were a big part of the seventies and eighties. They blew up the guy on I two ninety four. So, uh, yeah, it, it would be interesting. Um, 
anybody know anything about the flash trucking, drop me a line over at uh, Adam at Vegas Specialty Tools. Um, police officers' testimonies ain't worth shit. Okay, so Tony Montana, I could, you know, I, I'm going to say there are cops that are good. There are cops that aren't. So you, you, this is, we're, we're all human. So everybody's going to make a mistake. Do some people make intentional mistakes? I mean, for instance, how about Stephen Caracappa and Louis Eppolino from the New York Police Department? Now, there's a couple of cops that I would say are uh, complete shitholes. I mean, scumbags, just the, 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 the lowest thing on earth, uh, those guys. So maybe we'll do, you know what, I'm going to do a mob vlog about Stephen Caracappa and Louis Eppolito, in case you guys haven't heard about them and uh, and what they did. But they had a big to-do out here in Vegas It was because they lived here at the end before they got arrested, before they fought, were found out what they, the horrible, heinous things that those guys did. So double dippers on top of it, playing both sides, the police and the mob. So uh, Frank said that he decided not to tell anybody Blue had that gun. Uh, I do believe Frank saying something like that, that he uh, that he said he wasn't going to, he didn't say anything. So I think it was Fat Herbie called up the upper crust like 20 minutes after Bluestein left and said the cops just shot Blue and told him over the upper crust. So all the guys knew. Uh, Pete Lodato, great story. Hope the mob tour goes well. Visit all the, all the hole-in-the-wall places. Best to upper crust pizza like Slucker. Sucker Sam's Melrose Park. Slicker Sam, sorry, I know what you mean. Um, come back in Rose, follow a great mob. Who's better better than John Binder for sure? Yeah, okay. Sammy the Bull said some nice things about I did I heard Sammy the Bull said some nice things about Frank. Um that's uh that's uh that's awesome. Uh Tony Montana, police always planting <laughs> you guys are uh you guys are great. I love you because you know what? There's always two sides to a story. Remember that always. Uh, think Adam, I miss you. Frank in conversation. I do you the best. Thanks Pete. I appreciate that. Uh, Red. Yeah. Good point. Red. Why would Frank want to get involved? You know, why would he? You know, I mean, it's, it's a police matter. If you're, if you're, you know, if your house is filled with stolen furniture and you're getting ready to rob a jewelry store, the last thing you're going to do is go, hey, I got some information about this thing that just took over place over here with the police. Good point, Red. Why would he get involved? Yes, Ron Bruder, when 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 the boys ran the show out here, it was completely different. It was so different than it is now. I mean, you you could like you could go in a casino and you could buy, uh, you could play a few games of, of, of craps or whatever, and they give you a free buffet. If you lost a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, come on, let's call for your luggage from the dunes. We'll bring it over here to the sands, put you up in our nice suite. And uh, if you lost a lot of money, they'd say, look, you know, really sorry, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith. We hope you had a good time. But in a few months, give us a call. We'll send our private jet to pick you up and bring you back out here to Las Vegas. Just bring some of that money with to lose. They didn't care if the casino or if the, uh, the showroom made money, if the hotel made money, if the restaurants, the diners, the lounges, the bar, the parking garage, the valley, they didn't care if that made money. All that the, the boys cared about was if the casino was making the money. They wanted you to come in. They wanted you to gamble. They wanted you to get that, that, that gambling fever. And the next thing you know, you blow all your money and then leave. You know, I, I got a job out here. When I first moved to Vegas, I got a job and it was in a, it was in a, I'm not going to say the name of the, the bar and I'm not going to say anything else about, about this job other than it was a bar. It was a gaming bar. And here's what I was told by the owner he said the whole point of them to be here is to take the money from their pocket and put it into this machine right here. So the machine on the bar, the poker machine he said, then when they don't have any more money in their pocket, he said, then. What you want is you want them to go to that machine over there, the ATM, and have them get money out of that machine and then put it into this machine. And then have them go back to that machine and get more money and put it into this machine until that machine won't give them any more money. And then 
if their name's on the list over here uh, behind the bar, then, you know, if they have a paycheck, you can cash their check. It's good. Just take the money out of the job. I said, are you kidding me? Seriously. <laughs> but that's what it is. That's the whole point of Las Vegas. Like they said in Casino, what the hell do you think we're doing out here in the middle of the desert? You know, it's all about the money. That's what it comes down to in the end. Anyway, you lost your money in the casino. Didn't matter. The casino paid for the valets, the, the showroom. Uh, the casino had everything. They paid for the hotel rooms. Didn't matter if they gave half of the hotel rooms away. As long as they made the money in the casino and it floated everything else, it was fine. Nowadays, nowadays it's different. Here's how it works now. The casinos are owned by the corporations, thanks to Howard Hughes, which we could do an episode about that. But the, cas the, the casinos are owned by the corporations. And what they do is they, oh, we have a showroom right here. Well, we don't want to, we don't want to pay to put something into this showroom. Why would we want to pay to put something in the showroom? We'll let some producer come over and four wall it, which means renting the space between the four walls, but run their own box office, run their own promotions, run their own this and that. Oh, here's another space. Well, we don't want to deal with a restaurant. So they, here, rent the space out. Now that restaurant, if it makes it, it makes it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with what goes to get set down on the table in the casino. So it's a completely different game, completely different business model than it was back then. I personally, I liked it like it would have been back then because I'd rather have come to Vegas and, 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 and walked in and lost a few thousand dollars and them say, oh, don't worry about the room. Don't worry about your meals. Don't worry about this here, 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 here. And feel like you're given all this free stuff, okay, which isn't free, okay. <laughs> so remember, it all has to be paid for. So you're given this free stuff, but you felt good, like you got something for what you lost. No. Now, it's not like you have that hopeful feeling like, ooh, I got some free stuff. Now it's. Man, I went to Vegas, I had to pay $20 a day to park at the MGM. And then uh, the rooms cost me $250 a night. And I had to go out to dinner with my wife. And that costs, you know, $300 for the meal. And it, and all these things add up. And at the end of the vacation, you're like, oh, I lost uh, $5,000 in Las Vegas. But only 300 of that was at the blackjack table. Everything else was to the casinos and the valet parking or the, the paid parking and uh, you don't even get me started on this because I, I, I go off the deep end about it because it's just like they're getting greedier and greedier and greedier I, I know it was greed that started the whole thing but it's just like the corporations got greedier than uh than 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 all of them or something it's it's insane so anyway uh i i joe colada joe colada hey when are you going to do the script? Strike while the iron's hot. I am working on it, Joe. I'm working on it. It's good to see you, though, buddy. I'm glad that uh, that you were able to uh, tune in. And, uh, yes, I am throwing a lot of things down right now and working on a lot of things. And uh, it's coming along, though. I have a lot of, a lot of stuff outlined. Uh, let's see. John Allen. Hi, Red. Hi, Adam. Hi, Adam. Is that Ron that's on? Um, I don't know, uh, John Allen, who Ron is. Um, Matt Wilchowie, Adam and Frank ever say how much money is actually skimmed from the casinos that was sent back to the bosses? They say, uh, I've heard different numbers, uh, but $300,000 a month is the one that comes to the top of my head. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's, again, the Chicago outfit was skimming from... Chicago outfit was skimming from the uh, uh, the the Fremont, the Stardust, the Hacienda, and the Marina Casino. So I don't know if that's three hundred thousand dollars a month combined, uh, all of those, or if we're talking just off of the Stardust was three hundred thousand a month. That's what I had heard uh, or read somewhere, if my memory serves me correctly. Rocket League clips, how's it going? And Ron Bruder, 14 trips later, only one bad trip, one uh, big loss, most are profit. Well, Ron, make sure you have good luck. You come to Vegas and win. You're one of those guys. Usually, we'll see, this is February. So February, we let six people leave town with money, whereas in March, we let eight people 
leave town with money. So your chances of winning are better in March than in February. Uh, Tony Montana. Uh, I've been there 30 years. Love the place. Yeah, you cannot live in Las Vegas, though, and gamble. You can't do that, Lee Bird. You know that. Uh, I've seen too many people that come here and they, you know. Bob Stupex, Vegas World. Uh, Carl Foster, that is now the Strat. It's the Strat. And uh, they used to give you $50 to spend in their place. And they would hand you money. Go, Come on in. You didn't have to lose money. And then they give. No, it was different. It was way different. You still lost, but you felt better about it <laughs> for some reason, right? You just felt better. Faces of the Forgotten is a good, is good, and I love Red's Fireside Chats. Just starting on Frank's stories. Uh, grew up in Cleveland. We had a very strong mob since the fifties. Yes, you did. Uh, very strong. I was thinking about you because Devo came on. Whip it good. Thanks, Scott H. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> um, are the conversations going to be? Are the conv- Convention's going to be opening anytime soon. Timothy, I don't know about when they're going to be opening. They will be opening. Uh, I just heard David Copperfield's announced he's opening in mid-March, uh, mid to end of March, somewhere I think the 20th is when he's opening. So uh, anyhow, um, yeah, hopefully things will start to, to get cranking again. We haven't seen a whole lot of people, but the other night I drove into the, into the Flamingo parking garage and I drove in. I went back and forth all the way to the top, not a single parking spot, all the way back down, not a single parking spot. So, but I did get a good tour of the Flamingo parking garage. So the people that were with me, I was offered a job on the Vegas mob to relieve her. How's Vegas these days? Scott H, it's, like I say, man, it's picking up a little bit. So just a little bit. Um, is Joe Collada online? Yes, Joe is in here, guys. If you... uh. Who sold Frank the stolen walkie-talkies? So they weren't sold to Frank. Uh, if you remember, it was Pete Basil who uh, gave them to Frank as a peace offering after their little squabble in front of the uh, in front of the upper crust. You guys go back and look at it in, in one of the videos. I don't remember exactly which video it was, but if you put in Pete Basil, Frank Collada in the search bar on YouTube, you'll find the video. It'll, it'll come up. It'll pop up. Uh, $3,000 a month, probably for what? 3000 No, it's 300000 a month for uh, probably one of That wouldn't be profitable on four hotels in the 70s and 80s. It's a lot of money. And, and also, Howard Hughes offered the Stardust $15 million to try to buy the Stardust, but that was stopped by the state. Uh, for fear that uh, that Howard was becoming a, a monopoly of owning all the casinos. So I lived in Vegas and can see why uh, in sunny sea. I lived in Vegas for a while and I can see uh, and why can I I lived in Vegas for a while and why can see I did not I did like to gamble. But as I started going blind, I do not gamble anymore, and I moved away. Well, you know, Sonny, man, uh, that's, yeah, the, yeah, okay, I understand what you wrote now. I, I, I see what you, what you wrote here. Yeah, well, gambling's okay. If you could do a little bit here and there, that's fine, you know, I guess. But some people, man, they move into this town, and they just, they end up, they literally end up killing themselves. So it's, it's really a... Sad, you know, that's one of our, our uh, titles, Suicide Cat. The casinos will deny it, though, guys. They don't like that kind of publicity. So when people are jumping and people are uh, doing themselves in, no good. Hey, be sure to hit the like button, by the way, if you're watching. You guys hit the like button, smash it. Gets it out there. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to tell you that uh, I got an email today. Uh, and the other day when I was interviewing Red, we had Red were met on Mob Vlog. Uh, Gary Jenkins came up. He has a podcast, a Gangland Wire. Anyway, he and I are talking. We're going to set up an interview to do on Mob Vlog. That'll happen sometime at the end of March. Mid to end of March is when we'll do that. And Adam, what are the odds of a slot machine? Red, I have no idea. But I do know that they can tighten and loosen those machines. So, I mean, it's, it's a machine. So, Liebert... Uh, what's in the spot now where the upper crust was? 
I ate pizza with Frank on a guided tour with him. So, uh, Liebert, you may have had pizza with Frank over at Angelina's. That's where we used to go uh, and take the people on uh, the mob tour. And that's where Frank took the people. And even when we moved our tour over to the Tuscany and we were taken off out of the Tuscany, uh, he was still going over to Angelina's. I'm pretty certain the people who took the mob to Vegas mob tour then would have would have done the pizza at uh, the Tuscany. But what's in the spot where the upper crust was? That's a really good question. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain this uh, to you guys, uh, to you, Lee Bird, and the rest of you that want to know. Uh, I'm going to pull up something here and show it to you. So I'll share my screen in just a moment to put this up on the screen. And then I will show this to you. So let us... Share and let me find the tab here. Okay, so I'm going to share this map with you guys, and I'd like you to take a look. Uh, uh, let's see, right in. Let's pull this over. Okay, so the Upper Crust Pizzeria. The best way I can do this is just jumping into this in Street View to uh, give you guys an idea of where it is. Because the funny thing is I went into the upper crust maybe three months ago, four months ago. You know, it was August. It was in August, actually. It was in August. I went into the upper crust. I was making some videos. Okay, so here we go. The Pioneer Plaza Shopping Center. Now, keep in mind, I showed you guys earlier, you saw the picture in the one newscast about the upper crust. So let's jump in here and uh, take a look. Which, by the way, a little guy, I'm just kind of hanging him in the air here. <laughs> uh, 4170. Yeah, well, let's, let's just jump in and take a look. Let's see. So this is the parking lot where the upper crust is located or, or was located and right over here on the right where all this gravel area is let me see if i can move closer yeah the gravel over here this is where the pioneer bank stood the pioneer bank was a three or four story structure if i remember if i remember correctly they just tore it down too maybe five years ago four years ago i say just because i've been i'm driving past this thing for 16 years doing the tours so for all these years, here's what I was told. And I was told is that the upper crust was right here where the cricket building is. And you guys probably heard that. You may have even heard that come out of Frank's mouth, that the uh, upper crust was here. And that over here where it says dive bar was the My Place Lounge. Okay, that's, uh, so that's a little incorrect. Number one, let me start this off by saying, this building is not the original structure. This is in the location of the original structure, but is not the original structure. The, uh, the original structure, the original structure of the upper crust is actually the location, I should say, is actually this building right To the right of the dive bar is where the upper crust was situated. Now, if you look at the FBI surveillance photos of uh, Tony and Frank sitting at the upper crust, they were taken. Remember, they were taken from the bank that sat here in the second floor window. They had lip readers and they had uh, 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 FBI agents watching the upper crust. So, so when they took those pictures, you can even see from the angle of the picture, it's almost like they were taking them straight on. So this is actually where it was, where it was situated. Uh, the owner of the dive bar, the gentleman who owns it, when I was making a video over here of this particular place, I went in and I met the owner and I talked to him. And he said to me that he had even met Frank and talked to Frank and they discussed it. And originally the upper crust sat over here. On, to the south side of the dive bar, not the north side. So that's where it was originally uh, originally located. Okay, so uh, so there you go. Joe, Joe Colada, 
These oh, the walkies were a setup to get a warrant to search my brother's house and plant a listening device. So, so Joe, let me get this right then. So Pete was setting up Frank, which would make sense because he didn't like him, but he was setting him up. So did he do it for the police so that they could go in and get the warrant? Um, because I, I know that this led to the police getting a warrant and, and eventually busting him on the stolen furniture that was in the house. My memory serves me. Right. That's the way the story goes, is that it was in uh, that they were that that, that that was the bus that took him uh, that took him down, got him locked up the second time. And that's when they played the wiretap for him of uh, Tony and uh, Tony and Joe Lombardo. Uh, Lee Bird. Uh, Um, hmm. Lee Bird, I ate at the Tuscany's too, um, but on a tour with Frank, he was available that day. It was very good. Uh, Tuscany's, uh, Tuscan Gardens nice. It's a very nice restaurant. Did Mr. Collado leave us because of COVID-19? Damn it. Frank LaBella, uh, August 20th, unfortunately, my, my friend of last year. Uh, hey, Adam, any updates on that guy we saw? So Scott H. Scott was out here. Uh, not uh, what, what was that, Scott? You were out here just uh, 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 maybe a month ago, and Scott was traveling across the country. And anyway, he, uh, he's he been a prescriber for a long time. And I told you guys that because the tour business is shut down, you know, I've been meeting with some of my friends. They call. I don't have, you know, I have a lot of free time. So uh, so Scott and I drove around for the afternoon and we looked at a few different places and uh, and we went past the spot. And I don't want to say what it is, Scott, because I don't want to say this live on, on here where we, where we went and who we think we saw. But we, we think we uh, saw uh, somebody. But no, there's no update on that. I'm, I apologize. But if I get an update, I'll definitely let you know. Uh, you guys need to see Adam and get the real tour. You won't be disappointed. I promise Adam's a blast to hang out. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, Adam and Joe, did Frank ever say the meaning behind the name Upper Crust? George, yes. So the Upper Crust Pizza, Frank uh, and Leo Gardino opened it, and they were going to make authentic Chicago pizza. And now in Chicago, there is what we call deep dish. If you're not from Chicago, there's deep dish. But there's also what's called stuffed pizza. And stuffed pizza has a layer of dough in the pan. Then you put the fillings in, your cheese and, and meat and whatnot, your veggies and what. And then you bake that for a while, uh, not long. You pull it back out, and then you put a second layer of dough, the upper crust on the pizza. That's the upper crust. And then you cover that with your sauce and some more cheese, and it goes back in the oven, and it cooks the whole rest of the way, and you pull it out. And that's why it was called the upper crust, because they served upper crust pizza and it was the first uh joint in las vegas that served real chicago pizza stuffed pizza as a matter of fact it was one of wayne newton's favorite places to go and because you see here's what the cops did too they used to uh they used to harass the customers of the upper crust going in and out so wayne newton in an interview said oh i love the pizza over at their their joint you know he said but man, did I have to pay the the uh, tickets, the the, the 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 yeah the the tickets, and what he meant in that interview was the tickets because the cops would pull him over and they would give Wayne a ticket, and it was like ticket, you know, whatever little infraction to deter him from going to the upper crust. I guess Wayne's wife used to hang out inside the upper crust as well, used to go in there. But that's a whole nother story, and that's just little tidbits that I remember Frank saying and talking about. And, and some others. Anyway, that's where the upper crust got its name. Tim Halverson. Hey, how are you? Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, Tim. And I ate the Golden Steer and posted. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, Lee Bird. I saw that. I did see that. Um, cool. Frank Labella, rest in peace. Luminous grin. Howdy, Scott H. Chris. It was Christmas. It was right after Christmas that you were out here. Carl Foster, that life. Uh, would Wayne Newton be considered in Frank's circle or Vegas underworld? Seems associated, Philip Wright. 
So, interesting question. Um, I don't think so, though. I, I, I don't really think. But you got to remember, a lot of entertainers, and this is one of the reasons that the Gaming Commission out here in Las Vegas, when they put this uh, law into effect, they said, you cannot work in a casino and have ties to organized crime. You can't do that. And here's why you can't do that. Because we don't want you around the gambling if you are tied to organized crime. Makes sense. The problem is, or was, the problem was, is that you had Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra. I mean, these guys, all they played in were mob joints. That's what they that's what they did. They played in mob joints. And they uh uh, they had tons of ties because that's what they did. So they put that loophole in, and that's why Frank Lefty Rosenthal uh, took the position or the title entertainment director. That's why he had his television show, the Frank Rosenthal Show, that aired on TV. We ought to do an episode about that. <laughs> that show was so bad it was good. It's what they say, and I've watched some. I've watched a few clips of it, and it was. It was the only thing on to watch. So, uh, anyway, that that's that's why he gave himself that title. So I'm going to go off on a on a big tangent, but that's uh. So all of these entertainers, to answer your question, Wayne Newton, you know, they 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 worked for the, these guys. They were hired by him. So did they know him? Were they connected? Were they I, you know? Did Wayne Newton do bad things? I doubt it. You know? Did he know know people? I'm sure. Um. Hey, Mark. Sariva, Sariva, Sar, Sarava, Sar, Mar, Marco Sarava. Nice to see you. My blog, Hey Luminous, how's it going? Um, Josh and Jesus, if you could take a time machine back to any mob era, which would you choose? And what city would you choose? It would be a week's vacation. It would be, it, no, hands down, I would go back to the 70s in Vegas. I'd like to see that. No, the 60s in Vegas. I'd like to see the 60s in Vegas. That's the era. And I'd do a whole week's vacation. That'd be great. Yes. Uh, Carl Foster, I'm getting hungry. Oh, did I, that whole description of that pizza make you hungry? It should make your mouth water, Carl. Your mouth should be salivating from that description, okay? Because that's what that pizza does. That pizza is really good. We have a video. Uh, on here that we did on how to make that upper crust pizza. If you want to see that, check out. Just type in, type in uh, in the search bar, pizza and colada. It'll come up. I'm hoping next business trip uh, to Las Vegas, I can get some time with you uh, and the mob tour. Sonny, I'd love to. I would love to, man. I'm telling you, it's it's nice to see some faces and see some, uh, you know, see some friendly faces and all. Dwayne Lent, you're awesome, man. Let me tell you, you are awesome. Bob, Adam, you ever wish that you could have a uh, run with Tony and Frank back in the day? No, Bob, I've never wished that I could run with Tony and Frank back in the day. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, uh, Bob. I am like one of the, oh, God, Frank. I asked Frank once. I said, Frank, I said, back then, right, if I was you know, my age, if I was in the like 40s and you were 40s back in like 1980, would we have hung out at all? No way. There's no way. There's no way. In, he wouldn't have hung with me. Um, not, not in the heart. But said, Look at, come on, funny magician guy. Are you kidding me? No, not going to happen. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now you need to order a pizza, Gail. Just get on the thing. I'll show you how to make a pizza. Okay. I made one for Frank one day. And, uh, and, and he even said it was really delicious. And I'm telling you, it, it was good. Uh, but it was his recipe, the sauce and all. So, um, <clears throat> ask Frank about the hitman that was worse than the Iceman, John Allen. Uh, can't ask Frank, John. Um, he's new to the channel here. Uh, Carl Foster, clips of Frank show on YouTube. Yeah, there are some clips of Frank on YouTube. Also, if you do the tour, there's unseen footage of Frank on the tour as well, uh, him telling some stories. So uh, anyway, they made Las Vegas. Yes, they did. Are you interviewing retired mobsters? Sammy the Bull is hilarious. Frank LaBella, yes, but Sammy has his own channel. 
So why would why would you do an interview? Um, let's see. Yeah, I'd love Vegas in the '60s, Red. Were you you didn't get to Vegas until the '70s, right, Red? Uh, thanks, Gail. Nikki Andrews. Anything about the Black Book? Who got banned from casino? Anything about the Black Book? Who got banned from casino? Uh, so Tony Spilatro is in the Black Book. Uh, I could tell you that for certain. I know another guy in town who's also in the black book, who's trying to get himself taken out of the black book. I'm not going to say any names, um, but he, yeah. There, th what, what what gets you in the black book is, uh, you know, being involved uh, and having crime, you know, having criminal activities around the casinos or in the casinos will get you banned from the casinos being called so, and it, it's actually a gray colored book from what I understand. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm not in it. So, um, am I going to watch the Michael Francis, Mike Tyson interview on Monday? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I wasn't planning on it. I'm probably going to be working on this uh, show in some way, shape or form on Monday. Uh, any Gaylords left? I have no clue. Uh, I just learned who the Gaylords were the other day. Nardo man. Frank LaBella, yeah, I know. Just saying the guys are funny. Uh, dipped in acid, John Allen, LOL. Hey, Adam, magicians are very useful. Oh, boy. The intelligence services in the UK used the great masculine who helped their dirty trucks against the Nazis. Yeah, as a person, yes, yes, yes. That is true. Uh, he did. They used them to hide, to make the... the uh, trucks become uh, invisible from the bombers up above so they wouldn't be able to see the vehicles down below uh they uh, called upon a magician so and if in case you guys didn't know this johnny carson was a magician before he uh did his uh show and uh also arsenio hall was a magician and michael spilatro also did card tricks and magic so what about the straight lords no idea uh, just want to say you love the channel. Thanks, M. Strauss. I'm glad you're you're hanging around. The hitman Frank Collada talked about was Frank Schweiss. Said he was the worst of all. John Allen, yes, Frank Schweiss. Um, next time I read on, I'll talk to read about Frank Schweiss some more. So be useful to a mob guy. Yeah, that's funny. So <laughs> anyway, listen, guys. It's over uh, an hour and three minutes. We've been on. It was fun hanging out with you guys today. It was great talking with you. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I had a fun time. So I hope that you guys learned something. I hope that you guys got something out of this. I'm going to finish this up, wrap it up. And uh, uh, yes, Michael Spilatro did card tricks. Not Tony, but Michael liked to do a little uh, trust the digitation. So I don't know the biggest diamond Frank robbed. Uh, no, not that I know of any connections in Brooklyn, Frank LaBella. Uh, you're welcome, Nardo man. And uh, Jimmy Cozo knew a lot of gay men. Red woman. There you go. <laughs> Jimmy Cozo knew a lot of gay men. Uh, Scott H. Hey, man. Thank you very much for uh, hanging around. Carl, thank you very much. Uh, Philip Wright, see you later, pal. Bob, uh, lo the love of Sam G. and Kana's life. Phyllis McGuire recently passed in Las Vegas. Yes, she did. And by the way, I mistakenly called Phyllis his mistress in one of the videos. She was his girlfriend. Uh, he was already a widower. Um, you and me both, magicians, respect. Thanks. I appreciate that. And uh, right on to you. That, that, they're, they're, here, this is for you, Cut Chops. I'm going to pull my finger off. Ah. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Jane Weaver, thank you. Gail, that was nice to see you. Luminous Grin. Uh, yeah, hit the bell on your way out of the room, guys. Hit the bell, the notification bell. I'm going to try and, and do these at least three times a week, but most likely they're going to be in the weekday, but we're going to be shooting for 2 p.m. is the time, Pacific time. So we're going to try and stay at that same time each day. So if you guys want to check and see if I've put something up or if I'm doing one, uh, look around that time, okay? The mob made the skin disappear. Total magicians. Yeah, they were magicians, all right. They made people disappear, too. <laughs> uh, luminous grin. Hasta la pasta, Adam. See you later. Thanks, Red. I appreciate it. Nikki Andrews, uh, I'm on Patreon and Sammy the Vault's channel. So there's people who's talking about having to sit down with Frank, but Frank passed away. Yes. Well, 
Scott H. Uh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Joey, I'll see you next time. And, uh, and I'll have something for you. We'll have something uh, outlined, finished. So, Devin, thanks for watching. See you next time. Take care. George, see you later. See you later, Carl. Adios, guys. Have a great day. See you next time.